So, yeah, so thanks again for the opportunity. We've been in discussions with uh, with Vlad for years to, you know, to uh, to just uh, get together for a talk, but uh, everything like something happened. Most of the time family happened, uh, but now we are uh, we are remote. It, it makes it easier. So, yeah, I'm super happy that this year we we could cut it. Um, OK, and uh, I'm also trying to keep it super short. Uh, this will be at least the intro part because uh, we have approximately 30 minutes, right? And uh, this will be kind of a technical presentation, but you won't need to read too much of uh, code, but I, I will try to show you some demos here. Uh, so hopefully uh, this won't be uh, too heavy, uh, but yeah, this is your expert audience um, that should go. So what I what I'd like to uh, tell you about here is is some of the basic patterns of how we see companies do MLOps and uh, a basic intro of MLflow, how you can use MLflow for uh, for doing this. I want you to use myself, Vlad, you already done uh, this. Thank you for that. Uh, but I want to give you a bias warning and uh, with that a short intro of data power. So we are a professional services and training uh, consultancy and we uh, we do a lot of work with uh, with Microsoft and also with Databricks and MLflow the technology uh, has been initiated uh, initiated with uh, through Databricks and it's Databricks is still the biggest uh, biggest contributor there. So we have kind of a bias towards these technologies. We have some outlook to the other technologies like competing technologies, so for example, for, for uh, MLflow. Um, there are some, some open source and managed ones and also Microsoft has its own, but their core competence uh, lies uh, within this one. So for us, it's all gold and shiny because that's what we see. So um, the very basics. I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with uh, with this classic figure. This is the Chris DM uh, diagram, uh, which was published in 1996, a super old program about how companies do machine learning. Uh, what it what it says, it's basically common sense. It says you got to have a business understanding and then understand your data, prepare your data, model your data, evaluate, and just uh, just go and uh, iterate. So just to give you an example, for example, if you are a, let's say a real estate, an online real estate uh, website and you want to deploy a machine learning model which classifies the images your users upload, if it's a house or a flat or a kitchen you know, or a blueprint, then that would be a classic machine learning use case. So first you would need to understand what you want to do, of course, and um, what value these, this machine learning model will give you. Then you will need to understand your data, like how you can collect images, how you can label them, and so on. You will need to put them in a nice shape. You would need to train uh, a bunch of models. You could try different models, right? So if it's image recognition, then probably deep learning is a good choice. You would evaluate these models, uh, and this will help you with the business understanding, and eventually deploy this. Uh, to production. So that's like the very classic uh, life cycle of, of uh, machine learning. And there is another one which I like uh, even more. This is uh, from, a, from a guy uh, who, who leads the machine learning uh, meetup in, in Los Angeles, and he has a great talk, much better than, uh, than mine for sure. Uh, you will see it here at this YouTube link. And he has this uh, piece of uh, chart here, which is somewhat mere, somewhat more technical, uh, which says you have the raw data, then you split it, right? You build your model, you evaluate your model, eventually you deploy it, and deploying can be a hard stuff. And when you deploy your model, then you uh, go and score, so make your predictions with either real time or batch. And then you learn, evaluate, monitor, A-B test, and do all of these. Now, there are a few problems here. And one is how you can do this part, right? So if you if you work with uh, machine learning research, you know that you, you train a model, you tune the hyperparameters, then you have another model, 
and then you you tune them more you have another model and so on or you can you can do it of course with with some uh, other techniques like hyperparameter search but the exploratory search creates a bunch of models a bunch of knowledge and you can easily get track of uh, you can easily uh, can lose track of these uh, these models and the whole development so it can happen that you create a model it looks good but you set it aside and then two days later you have a, a better model and you have in your mind like okay but i had this model from like two days later which performed very well in a certain case what were the hyperparameters there how can i get back to this model usually that model is already gone because you're iterating in a, a jupyter notebook or some notebook environment and uh, that's one thing to fix in a classic uh, machine learning lifecycle, and then the other one is the uh, the deployment. So when you want to hand over a model from as a data scientist to a data engineer team or an MLOps team, then it might be hard because, for example, uh, it can happen that you you made a model or you built your model with a certain technology. Let's say you did it with Apache Spark on a cluster. But your pr production app, which is operated by uh, by engineers, they it doesn't have a it doesn't have Spark. It's a production app. They don't want to use Spark for that. They want to make the predictions with normal scikit-learn, for example, or you know even I would say like a normal Python application in a web app. So this can be hard here, and that's exactly what you see here in the next chart, is that there are so many technologies. Uh, data scientists use for model building and so many technologies for model serving and this can be inter just so intertwined in sophisticated ways like if you have a model again for example uh, in spark how you how will you be able to uh, serve it in a standard docker uh, environment where you require high performance and so on and mlflow tries to uh, help you there too so it has a standard model packaging format. It's able to package your models like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, R models, Spark models, and, and different other models. Package it in a standard format and then deploy it in the standard format to different systems. And this format, what it provides is uh, it's open. So MLflow is open. It's an open source product. And uh, also the it's modularized very, very well. So if you have your own model format or you want to do some customization, you will be able to uh, to do that and extend. It's a it's a Python by, uh, Python library basically, and then for the model serving, it um, it has a Docker component and a Flask, so a web service component. It's super easy to uh, to set it up and use. I will show you uh, this in the in the demo. So that's about um, that's about the standardization and then also mlflow shows you uh, it gives you opportunities to manage the life cycle of a model in a way that when you build your models you can put it into a model registry you can think about the model registry as uh, as a database for um, for your models where your models can be in a, a development environment or in a staging environment so test you can promote the models to tests your test environment or uh, to production. And also uh, you can go and serve these models. So you can set up model serving. Here you see this Databricks icon because Databricks has a, a built-in model serving there, but also open source MLO has a, a great serving component. So that's one thing. And then I will show you the, uh, the fourth component, so to say the MFO tracking UI where you can save models and save hyperparameters and compare these and, and go back and reuse models you built earlier. So that's what I want to show you here in the next 20 minutes. And everything I do here will be on Databricks, but keep in mind that there won't be anything Databricks specific in this talk. You can take the notebooks you have uh, the link here for the notebooks and download it at home create either a database trial on azure and just uh, use it 
or you will see there will be uh, instructions on how to do this completely open source. That means using a Zeppelin or a Jupyter notebook and downloading MFLOW uh, with a, from the Python uh, package index and just uh, installing it. So I just wanted to point this out that even though we use Databricks here, which is a commercial solution, nothing you will see here is a, a commercial fix. Everything is open source. It's just put together here uh, in Databricks so it's easy to use and easy to demo for us. These notes, by the way, uh, will be distributed to you after the call, uh, talk. So again, feel free to check it out and everything should be plug and pay, play work and uh, at home after this talk. So let me fire up a, a browser for this. And there we go. All right. So let's go to the hands on piece. Again, here uh, you will see a, a we will show some skin. If you are less technical, then don't worry about it. I will point out uh, what every code cell does, and we will have a bit of a UI interaction too. What you see here, uh, this is Databricks, the uh, the software. You can think about it as a as a notebook environment, which has MFO integrated and also some cluster management integrated. Here in this demo, we run on Spark, which is uh, distributed uh, distributed data management environment. We are going to use the Spark ML Lips or Spark's machine learning library for uh, for building a model. But you can do exactly the same with Scikit-Learn or R or any other component. So let's see. Here in the beginning, in the intro, you will see how you can go completely on-prem or how you can use this notebook at home. This notebook, what you see here, this is what uh, I linked in the presentation. So you can download it straight away. OK, so let's jump into it. So our data set is a, a famous data set that's out there on the Internet is the so-called Combined Cycle Power Plant data set. It's, uh, it's data collected from an Istanbul uh, Combined Cycle Power Plant and uh, it has different features of the environment and also the power emission for the next hours and it's a great uh, toy machine learning data set this is what i'm going to uh, use here so let's go on and use this spark cluster in this notebook to uh, read the data so if you're not familiar with spark don't be afraid it's just a data management technology we are reading a uh, uh, parquet file, which is kind of like a CSV on steroids. If you ever work with CSV, check out parquet. It's a so much better technology to uh, to store your data into. And we are renaming some of the uh, some of the columns here. And here we go. So this is our data set. What we are after is that we have a, a temperature, so outside temperature recorded in Istanbul. We have atmospheric pressure, we have outside humidity, we also have the vacuum speed. The vacuum speed is how fast the steam of this power plant um, escapes the plant. And then we have power emission. This will be our label. This is what we want to uh, predict. This is what we build the model. So these are historical data. Let's go and uh, build a simple uh, Spark model on the top of it. Again, that's just a Spark boilerplate code. We tell Spark that we are interested. So we want to pick up those columns uh, as features, which are not the power emission, but all the rest, and uh, create later a features column based on this. And we are creating a linear regression object here. We will not do anything fancy. Uh, we go and try to solve this uh, prediction problem with linear regression where we say we want to predict the power emission based on the features column, and we have some basic standard parameterization of this. We use the Spark uh, Machine Learning Pipelines API to pull everything together, and we will be interested in two metrics. One is the so-called RMSC. Very, very widely speaking, this is the average error of the prediction. You want to get this number as low as possible, 
So the difference between the actual values and the prediction. And we also have another, uh, another metric called R squared. That's again a standard metric. It means like how much of the variance in the, in the data your machine learning model catches. All that matters is that the closer it is to one, uh, the better it is. So you want to have a higher R square and the lower RMSE. So let's train a model. Okay, so we trained the model that was, uh, well, we haven't trained the model. We just prepared the model that was quite fast. So let's go split our model into a uh, train, train set and a test set. And um, let's take a look. So here what we do, we make a simple random split. We fit this uh, model, so this uh, pipeline on the train set, and then uh, predict on the test set and just display the, the rest. Here you will see we have the original values and uh, we also have some internal values like the, the feature vector and the prediction. So here's the prediction, here is the power emission. You see that that's quite close so far. So not that bad, but of course, we don't know anything about this data in this demo, so uh, we can't judge how, how good it is. We can get the our we can get our metrics like the RMSC, which is around 5.1, and also the R squared around 0 0.9. So let's go and check out how MFLO can help us. Uh, managing uh, and keeping this motor building on laces. So let's go into MFLow. In MFLow, in MFLow tracking, you have two uh, important concepts. One is an experiment. You can think about an experiment as a, a problem you want to tackle. So our experiment here is making a good prediction. So let's set up an experiment. This is like the, the shell of an MLflow, uh, an MLflow um, life cycle. So it says, OK, this is now a new experiment. It doesn't exist. Sorry. So now we have a new experiment here. Here in Databricks, it shows up in your folder. It is the NDR conf experiment. And if you use it open source, then you can start MLflow on your computer. It will give you a, a URL and you can connect your MLflow there, and that will be uh, your server which hosts all the experiments. So when you don't use an integrated MLflow location, you can just set up an MLflow server and connect to it, and you have exactly the same experience of what you will see here. Now, what we want to do is we want to train a model and log two things about this model. One, the parameters of this model, like, you know, what is the, uh, the regularization of this linear regression, what is the elasticity parameter, or the hyperparameters of our model. And we also want to log the metrics, like how well this model performed, like RMSC and R square. And it's fairly simple with MLflow. We start a so called run. Now, one run, it is always like one hit, one try of modeling. You set the hyperparameters, you train your model, you evaluate it, this will be one run. So we will say, hey, MFLow, let's start to run. I want to call it linear regression with default parameters. I'm retraining the model exactly the way uh, how I did it uh, up there, just to have everything in the same cell here. And then I will say, OK, log these parameters that this model, the method is a linear regression. You can log any key value pairs in MFLow, and you will see how you can use it uh, in a minute. And also log uh, all the hyperparameters of this linear regression to MLflow. I will show this to you in a minute what, uh, what it has logged. And then also let's log the metrics after training. So what is the RMSC and what is the R square? So again, we trained, we predicted and logged all the parameters and the metrics. We put it to the screen, same values, no surprise, right? We just copy pasted everything to the cell. And then we ended this MFLow run. Now, before I show you the MFLow UI, let us make a new run. So let's say, OK, let's uh, change our regularization parameter, which is a linear regression hyperparameter, like how the internal machine learning logic works. So that's an expert parameter. Let's decrease it to 0 0.1. The default was 0 
give this run name, decrease regularization, and just do exactly the same. Right? Just train, fit, log the parameters, log the metrics. Let's execute this trainer model and uh, log it to MIflow. So there you go. Uh, we are good. You can see that we got to a fairly better RMSC with this new hyperparameter and approximately the same R square. So let's take a look at the MFLOW UI now that we have some data in it. I will go to workspace and if I click the NDR conf experiment, it's going to uh, take me to the MFLOW server UI. This is exactly what you will see if you use an open source version. Uh, so if you uh, simply execute it. You see that we have uh, two runs here. One is uh, one is the first one, the default parameters. It also has a check mark because this run is finished. I executed finish run uh, in the cell. The second one isn't finished yet. We will have a reason for that. This is the decrease regularization. You see the parameters here, like elastic net, maximum iteration was the method and also the metric. So you can compare. You can take a look at any of these runs and then uh, take a value of all the parameters that were logged. I restricted this implicitly in the first cells, which I haven't showed you uh, to only log these parameters. So we don't have like all the dozens of parameters here and also the metrics. And you can also log any artifact like any chart you created or any binary you created uh, to this one. And if I go back. Then I can also compare these. Ones. So I can say let's compare these two. These are the two runs you see. These are the different parameters and these are the different uh, methods. So anytime you want to come back and just take a look at which which run performed best in a certain use case, you can use this UI to come back and just check out what's going on. And you can also chart this. It has a bunch of charting options, but again, just because we don't have too much time, I want to keep it at the bare uh, essential. So the basic chart is at this chart where you Pick the x axis. So, for example, the regularization parameter, what we uh, what we checked and changed, and then uh, the RMSC, the metric that we went after. And here you will see that with a lower regularization parameter, in our simple example, we had a better RMSC. You can check out all the rest of the parameters and what the actual run was with these charts. So you can keep everything under control here uh, with MFLOW. We use it in some of our projects and this tracking UI works very, very well. So let me go back to the notebook. So now we have an experiment and let's assume that you find a good model and you want to take this model and put it to production. And here the MFLOW model registry helps you. So first of all, I will take this model, my last model, this one, which I trained here, and just log it into this run and then end the run. So I will say, I want to keep this model. So hey, MFLOW, can you just, you know, log this model, just save it. It uh, takes a while until it's saved to the server, to the MFLOW server, and now I finish this run. If I come back here, you will see that now I have both my runs finished here, and this one has a model, right? It says there is a Spark model. I will come back to this in a minute, but first I want just want to show you that moving on, then you can also not only use the UI, but of course do everything programmatically. You can use the MFO API, for example, search through all the runs, it has its own query language. It tells you, you know, like for example, get all the runs in the descendant order. Here we have all the runs are created with start time, end time, all the metrics, all the parameters. Who did that? What's the name? You know, which notebook? Any kind of integration you can get here in Databricks or in the Jupyter notebook, it will be uh, added here. So you can also use it in a programmatic way. So let's put this model in production, and this is the uh, MFO production component, so the model registry. You can think about the model registry as a super simple component, actually. You can push a model, register a model there, 
and then just flag this model as production or test or development or anything like this. So you can promote this model and keep track and revoke and manage the life cycle of a, a certain model you want to deploy. So here we go. Let me take a look at this model, which I logged. It's coming up here. OK, so this is the model. It's in it's in a spot. It's a so-called spark flavored model. I, I trained this model in spark, so the internals of the model will be spark. I can go and just say, hey, register to model this model into the registry. Just create a new model for it. So I would call it uh, NDR demo model. Register it. Might take a second until it gets registered. And after that, you can go to the uh, model registry component of MLflow. Again, in, in an open source solution, that would be a menu item here in data races here under models. And here you see, this is registered. It also tells you if I click it, that we have a single version of this model so far, and it's not staged for test or production. It's just uh, a model that we registered. And I can go on and, um, and just say, uh, OK, so here is my, my model, and I can try later to transition this to, let's say, uh, staging. So staging means test, right? I can add the comment to my fellow data scientists or data engineers, and I can uh, transition it to staging right away, or I can request a transition if I want to have a, uh, a second eye taking a look. And also through the API, you can add the description, you can add text, and then query these models by text. So it's kind of a database of your uh, model lifecycle. Let me go back to the UI. And now I want you here to just take a break, empty your head about all this Spark stuff that we did, and just imagine that we are back in a native Python app, which has nothing to do with this model training or anything like this, in a Flask app or anything like this. As you will see in the next few cells, I won't use any Spark specific or you know notebook specific code. You can imagine we are in a uh, in a Python application. I created an MFLow client connected to MFLow, and I can check what models there are. So let's imagine we are in a let's say in a production Flask app, and it just tries to pull the production model to start predicting. And here you see we have a staging model, of course. So I would go on and I would say, hey, give me the production model. So the model which is uh, in production right now, it says no models flagged as production. Let me come back and just promote this model to production. So from the staging, I will say transition this to production. No comment now. OK, so this is now a production model, the first version of this model. If I'm coming back again to my production app, I'm just checking now. Is there a new production model? Yes, there is. And here is the path. So this is actually now on an Azure block storage. This is what we see with uh, DBFS. So this model is here, and you can read it. And even though this model is a Spark model, you can load this into plain Python because that's what MFLow does. It gives you a wrapper to create Python functions, for example, from different kinds of models that you train. It can be TensorFlow model, a Swart model, or a, an MLEAP distributed model. It will give you a Python function for prediction. You don't need to care about the underlying technology. So you will simply be able to say, hey, MFLow, load this model. Again, no Spark is used. Everything goes on behind the scenes. And now you have a prediction function, a plain Python prediction function that you can use for prediction in your production app. And let's try to go and predict. I will create a pandas data frame for it. With you see, I populate the temperature, vacuum, speed, pressure, and humidity with some dummy values. And I want to use MLflow for, uh, for predicting this. So any data, you can imagine this data is our operational data that, that hits my API, my production API. And I can simply take this function which I extracted from MLflow and just say, hey, 
predict uh, based on the data that I uh, received. And here you will get back with the predictions for these two rows. So it's quite simple. Uh, of course, it has some caveats. But for example, you won't be able to deploy an R model into a Python environment, but most of the technologies MFLOS uh, uses and supports is, are Python based and they interact very, very well. So this way you can use the MFLOS library in a, a Flask app or any, any Python application to make predictions. And also there is a serving layer, which is well, it's here in data is integrated, but once again, serving model serving is also an open source feature. You can go and uh, create a serving server, or if you go open source, you can create a, uh, a serving web uh, web service, a REST based web service by executing MLflow serve, or here in data you value well, you click, and then you have your serving UI, and then you are, uh, you get the model URL. And then you can have a REST UI where you can send your features and you're getting the predictions. And so here you will see like how the model can be, uh, be caused from, from different environments and also how you can set up authorization. So wrapping this up, because this is really what I wanted to show you uh, in this 20 minutes demo, is that MFLOW is an open source solution which gives you a great way for tracking your uh, experiments, so the hyperparameters and how they perform and going back. And when you're ready to productionize, you can go and use the uh, uh, use the lifecycle management, so the model registry to making it to production, integrate this with your, uh, either integrate this with your production application or directly use the MFLOW model serving API uh, using it. So and making productions. It's all out there and free. So it's on it's at mlflow.org. There it was, mlflow.org. So you can go and download it right away or simply install it uh, with pip in uh, if you work with, uh, with Python. And if you're interested in the uh, again in this demo, then just make sure you're checking out uh, these resources. You can import this notebook uh, to this download location, and it should go on a database cluster. It should go on an Azure data, which should go plug and play. So you should be able to execute it and recreate everything that uh, we've just done. Or you can follow the instructions on how to do uh, all of this open source and open source and completely on in a Jupyter notebook. So this is what I wanted to uh, wanted to show, and thanks for. So much for listening, and I believe we have a few more minutes for questions. And thank you, Zoltan. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one being, um, is there any already available uh, feature to automate a grid search? Uh, like, for example, using many hyperparameter range, uh, ranges for model runs? Um, yes. Yes, so the, the grid search is, uh, yeah, this is twofold. So for the grid search, it's implemented not in MLflow, but in, in, in the framework you use for machine learning, right? So if you use Spark, Spark has a, a grid search component. If you use Python, scikit-learn, it has a grid search component. I know that uh, with Spark, MLflow is very well integrated. So you can you can create a grid search and log every uh, every hyperparameter that you try. And uh, I'm not sure about uh, the other technologies like scikit-learn, but with a single hook in scikit-learn or Keras, you should be able to do it very, very simply to, to log everything you go through. Very cool. Very cool. Um, all right, next uh, next one would be, th this is a more uh, architectural question. Uh, what is the biggest challenge while implementing a solution using MLflow? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, this could take another hour, right, to, <laughs> to discuss. Um, I think the biggest challenge is if you, if you are into uh, DevOps, is that you usually have separate environments for development and staging and production, right? This is how you develop a, an application. And in MLflow, you would have a, 
MLflow for dev, an MLflow for staging, and an MLflow for, for production, but MLflow itself has this. It has this development and staging and production. So I think the bigger challenge is to, to tailor this to your use case if you want to have different environments and different MLflow model registries, for example, uh, for testing and for production, or you have different environments for the core code and you have one model registry that just or art is over these and you, you manage it centrally. And yeah, it's really because you, use you, you can use different projects in MLflow or different MLflow instances or. Yeah, it depends on your experience and what you're trying to achieve. I yeah, guess. exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah, <laughs> makes total sense. Um, how can you figure out what kind of input can be processed by predict func? You know, the model loaded through MLflow. I'm yeah. assuming there, there is some specification or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yes, it's uh, by default, I believe it takes a pandas data frame. And uh, if you set up a REST API, it has its own uh, JSON format. It's, it's all in the documentation. So you, you send the features and then um, the documentation tells you how you should, how you can be able to, uh, to send it. And if it's not enough, so for example, if you run an A-B test and you, you want to add more features to it, uh, which you want to uh, handle in a, with a custom logic, then you can add some pre-processing steps to, to an outflow, so you can extend it with, with Python classes. All right, so, so it's pretty flexible in that regard. Yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, one, uh, one other question, this time it's, uh, <laughs> it's personal from, from my side. Uh, a lot of times, well, uh, I was start. I, I was using MLflow. I started, um, you know, not not having, uh, not by having an MLflow installation, but just uh, logging everything locally, mm -hmm. uh, logging all the metrics in the local folder, uh, just so I could get some tracking. Uh, however, that's not the, the the most scalable solution, as uh, as you most likely know. What what strategies do you suggest? To people who are just uh, getting started with this, uh, just trying out, trying it out to, to log a few metrics, and then, yeah, they, they want to move uh, to the cloud or to to something more serious. Yeah, so I think uh, everyone does it. How what you just what you just said, Vlad, right? So the <laughs> first is you download MFO, you say like MFO run, and then you have your tracking server. What so what uh, what we do uh, in our in our uh, company is that we have an internal MLflow server for like more serious playing play, but we work a lot with Databricks and it's all integrated there. If you if you want to move to uh, to a cloud, I would well I would suggest either you uh, you fire up an EC2 instance or some Docker container with, with MLflow and then you have it out there. Uh, or you use Databricks, it's very well integrated there. Or if you're not tied to MLflow, there are also different managed solutions like uh, Microsoft has its its uh, machine learning tracking API, which is like a, a fully managed solution, which which manages everything that you just as uh, our data with process with with MFL. So yeah, also check out the other solution. Yeah, pretty cool. So so there are alternatives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think depends that's how much time you want to spend. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> 